Hello everybody, uh, thank you very much for having me to speak to you today. I'm really sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, it's one of those things where the time of year means that the kind of 48 hour door to door journey is just not quite possible because of the, you know, we're in the autumn term and it's all a bit uh, full on here at the moment. So I'm really sorry that I can't be there. I would have loved to have come. Um, I came to the Liaison Conference in Cape Town a few years ago and I can honestly say it's one of the best experiences that I've had professionally in my life. It was an absolutely fantastic thing and I really enjoyed it. Would have loved to have come and I will eventually get back to South Africa and uh, hope to meet some of you in person. Anyway, thank you for having me virtually. Um, and obviously we're here to talk about user experiences in libraries and I'll tell you a little bit about what we've done at my own institution um, and we'll talk about steering and guidance, how we've kind of tried to embed UX as part of the, the business as, as usual, kind of part of the, the culture of our organisation. Um, and we'll look at training and, and all the other things that we've done to make that possible. Before we get that far, uh, I just wanted to, if I drag myself over here, um, show you this picture. So my great granddad was a painter um, by profession and he made a journey from England to Australia and then back again, uh, during which he painted everything that he saw along the way on the boat. And I'm sure you recognise this view. Um, his artistic talent passed on to his son, who was also a professional painter, onto my mum, who's an incredible uh, artist and uh, was a, a children's illustrator for a time, and also to my daughters, who are very good at drawing, and it completely missed me out. I am awful at art. I cannot even draw a straight line. Um, but my great granddad was pretty good. So uh, this was a view that he um, painted in 1910 or thereabouts. Um, so you can see if we just kind of merge it with a, a more contemporary view of the same space, that's what he was painting. Um, so if you've ever wondered what Cape Town looked like in 1910 from the sea, then uh, that gives you some kind of insight. It's a lovely painting. I have it on my wall and uh, I had such a great time in Cape Town. So it kind of reminds me of that great experience. Okay, enough self-indulgent stuff about my family and paintings and heirlooms. Let's talk about user experience. Um, so for me, before I started to understand user experience in the library context, I associated it with web usability testing and online stuff and apps. I didn't realise that there was a more face-to-face -face kind of dimension to this. Um, and as I've come to understand it in the library context, it's essentially an umbrella term, UX user experience, and it covers a, a, almost a two-stage process or a cycle, starting with ethnography, uh, and then moving on to design. And very simply put, um, the ethnography allows us to understand our users better, and then the design allows us to change things to improve our services. Um, so ethnography is often rooted in observation. It's about looking at the kind of subjects of the studies and seeing how they truly act and how they behave. And if you think about it, quite a lot of our... Uh, feedback mechanisms in libraries tend to be attitudinal. Um, so, you know, we have surveys, we have focus groups, and we ask people about what they think, but they sometimes don't always give us a great insight into what people actually do. Uh, whereas UX is focused on, on behaviour first and foremost. Certainly we found, and I know a lot of other libraries using these techniques have found, that you get an insight that you can't get through traditional data gathering methods, and sometimes you get insights from users which they themselves couldn't have articulated before without using some of this methodology. So the, eth the ethnography allows you to understand the user and then we're trying to use human-centered design, always keeping the user in mind at every stage of the design process. And you think that would happen by default anyway, but it doesn't a lot of the time. And certainly in libraries we can often be quite process-driven uh, and it's easy sometimes to lose sight of the of the user or not have them in our mind as we're crafting our, our services and um, some, sometimes the products that we make. So what we're trying to do with, with UX is make several small design changes to improve that day-to-day -day user experience. If I'm a visitor to your library, if I'm a student or, a, or an academic at your library, or I'm using the online services that you provide, what is it about that experience which makes it good or bad or pleasurable or frustrating? You know, where, where's the kind of points where the emotion 
and the, uh, how, how you feel about your library um, is kind of crystallized. And often UX can identify those key points and then allow you to try and make changes to how you design your services to improve things. And that's such a big, useful thing to do. You know, obviously it's great when we can make these big headline changes, you know, moving buildings to a brand new premises or something like that is fantastic but we can't do that very often some of us you know there's just no option to do that at all so when we can make small changes that make the day-to-day -day experience better for our users that's a really big thing um this is a kind of a movement ux and libraries which is um certainly in the, in the us they've done it for for a while in the scandinavian countries in europe it's been a big thing and it's spread across the globe uh it's reached us in the in the uk it's reached you um and certainly you know if you're looking for good examples of of embedded ux you know ux that's part of the day-to-day -day life of a library then the the scandinavian countries norway sweden uh countries like finland for example they've they've been doing this stuff for years they're they're really good at it um, but for us, it's relatively new. And certainly in the UK, this community of kind of practitioners has grown in the last really th three or four years. And we're all kind of moving together forwards through our understanding of what it is, why it's good, what we can get out of it, how to make it part of what we do. Um, UX is above all quite messy like it's not a, a neat easily pigeonholed process it takes a while to do um, it's incredibly insightful which is why we still do it even though it takes the time so as a rule of thumb they say that uh, there's a four to one ratio for UX in other words if you do one hour of field work you'll need four hours to analyze uh, write it up make recommendations make design changes and so on so that's five hours you know just from one hour of, of, of being of watching space that's a lot of time um, but what you get out of it is so so insightful so powerful and so interesting that certainly we've started to see it as a massive cog in our kind of you know machinery of understanding the users and, and we found it justifies the time it takes essentially it's because it's making an impact and that's the thing as long as libraries are finding the impact is being made on the users then it's got to be worth looking at and and ux is not a fad like it's really not a kind of cool new thing which has come along and is going to burn brightly for a while and then die it is an absolutely key part of of what libraries should be doing it is designing better services based on a true understanding of the users and that is invaluable the other thing about ux is it's moving to a state of maturity um you know it's not what when ux first started to become popular in this country everything was a project it was perpetually in project mode we were all dipping our toes in the water without fully committing to it and over the last three or four years it started to move to something where it is a more accepted part of the vernacular you know it's it is part of what we do it is part of a, an ongoing process uh, rather than being a kind of a one-off thing that you put in a corner and do to see what it's like so it is moving to uh, it's moving to maturity um, on a kind of global level which is really nice to see so when I was first introduced to this whole subject uh, I found it very difficult to understand in the abstract and, and in fact I went to a conference about it which I'll talk about in a second before which I really didn't know what it was I, I knew it sounded terrifically excited I knew that people who did it were huge advocates of it but I still didn't really get it um, and I think you need concrete examples in order to you know get your head around it so just in case there's anybody uh you know sitting here today who who is thinking what really is this about in practice let me take you through a, a brief kind of timeline of of what we've done at my own institution so that you can see the kind of way in which we've used ux um if you're not familiar with the university of york uh you can see it's in the north of england as we zoom in on it here um and it is a 1960s university um uh it's it's quite good um i would say that because i work there um and we have about uh, 18,000 students or something like that um so quite a lot of people that we that we serve and we have two campuses two main campuses and the the, the library is on the western campus and you can see some 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 of our instagram pictures of it here that's the building that i work in here's a kind of nice view of uh of the the we, ha we have three buildings next to each other um which which constitutes the library um so in terms of the way that we've used ux uh this is a kind of timeline unfolding on the screen now 
of of what we've done. Um, so it started with a conference, which I'll mention uh, in a second. We've just finished the UX space project towards the far side of the screen, and we've got a, a, an understanding faculties project coming up this year. Uh, although there's not much this year left, so we need to get a move on with that one. So. You may be familiar with the User Experience in Libraries conference. Um, it's run for four years. I've been on the organising committee for a couple of those years. Very international. We have more people not from the UK attending than we do from the UK attending. Um, and the first of these conferences was in 2015. And we really went for it at, the, at my University of York library. We sent five members of staff from different teams. It was a three day conference. It was extremely intense. Um, three days of hands on stuff. This was not listening to talks. This was doing UX um, and we tried out and learnt about five main ethnographic methods which I'll take you through in a second and it was absolutely fascinating it was exhausting it was invigorating it was the best conference I've ever been to but at the end of it we felt a little bit like this like what do we actually do now like this was amazing this is brilliant we need to do all this stuff but what do we actually do in practice like what's the first step towards actually trying this stuff out so we came back to those five main ethnographic methods and you know if you're brand new to this whole area I can't recommend highly enough just doing a project you know like pick a demographic or pick a space and just do a little bit of, of ethnography on that space and see what you can learn in our case we decided uh, to employ Emma the intern um, to do the field work for us uh, and this led to our very first UX project which we now know as, as summer UX which was a kind of two-month project um, looking at how people use the library and this was our way of dipping our toes in the water and it it was really a case of is this going to be good for york like we know it's good in theory but is it actually useful for information services at the university of york or not let's find out um so it was led from within the academic liaison team and i'm part of that academic liaison team at york um emma did the field work and the aims were a couple of things first of all to try out the five techniques. Can we learn stuff from these techniques? Are they useful for us? And secondly, to, to produce a little bit of a, a UX toolkit for future projects. You know, not just learning about the users, but learning about UX techniques themselves. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the toolkit later on. The focus was on postgraduate students because it was during the summer, they were the ones that were around. So taught postgrads and research postgrads. And we ended up speaking to about 25 students. Now 25 doesn't sound like very many compared to if you're doing a survey of 3,000 students, but trust me 25 is an awful lot of people. It takes a long time to do that uh, and it, in fact it corresponded almost exactly to our 4 to 1 ratio. Um, Emma did 25 hours of field work and 100 hours of analysis over the two months. So. Um, it was very full on. It was absolutely fascinating. We were really lucky that we had a great intern who showed a lot of initiative. Um, but what we did in terms of techniques, first of all, we started off with observational behavioral mapping. So this is really just sitting in the space, sitting in one area of your library and making a note of what happens uh, using a kind of the, a framework known, known as the AEIOU framework, which gives you things to look for, essentially. Um, after some initial observation to kind of get a feel for how the space was used because Emma wasn't uh, a member of staff or a student at York so she was new to the institution we moved on to the, the the directly interactive techniques we used a couple of techniques touchstone tours and cognitive maps leading into an unstructured interview if you're not familiar with these a touchstone tour is where you let the user take you on a tour of the library so you're not taking them they're taking you and you're not correcting them when they're telling you things that are actually incorrect. Um, so they will take you on a tour of the library, they'll show you the spaces that are most important to them, they'll show you what they use, uh, and they will tell you what their touchstones are, what their key things are that are important to their library experience. And it's absolutely fascinating, and you listen, and you record it, and you analyse it, you make a note of where they do take you and where they don't take you. There's certain you know, buildings or spaces they might leave out, which is in itself is quite insightful. Um, and then we ask people to do cognitive maps, and I'll show you a couple of examples of these. A cognitive map is just a map from memory. Um, it can be of a process or it can be of a space. Of all the things that we've done in, in UX th throughout the last three and a half years, a cognitive map leading into an interview has been in every, pretty much every single thing that we've done. It's such a good combination. When you ask people to draw a map, for example, of the library, instantly they're completely in their own world. They're not thinking like they might be in a focus group or an interview. What does the librarian want to hear? 
Um, they're not thinking about what you want. They're just thinking, they're just putting stuff out of their brains onto a piece of paper. And I, I can't stress enough how the conversation that follows is completely different when an, a cognitive map has been drawn first. Like they're fascinating in and of themselves. And what happens is the user draws the map and then you say, right, can you take me through your map? Um, and then they will talk you through it. And then you use the information you gain from being talked through it as fodder for the conversation that follows. So you don't have a list of questions going in. You know, you ask the questions, you have a genuine conversation with the user based on what you've learned from the map. And the whole atmosphere, the whole uh, interaction is so centered in the world of the user when you start off with the cognitive map. Um, so we use a combination of these going into the unstructured interview. And by unstructured, we literally just mean there is no list of questions before you start. We also did uh, love and breakup letters. This is the, the most, the strangest construct of the UX techniques that we tried out, where you essentially ask uh, the user to write a love letter or a breakup letter to a library service, not to a member of staff. Um, and the idea here is that you get to the emotion of what makes something good or bad. It's definitely the strangest thing that we've, we've done. I'll show you a couple of examples. It's sometimes really effective. Other times the user is just so baffled uh, that you kind of don't do it. In all of these cases, you know, we get the user's permission, we get a consent form uh, signed from them, uh, and if any any user is ever uncomfortable with anything, we don't ever push them. Um, so we've never had anyone who's wanted to withdraw, but we have had a couple of people uh, who said, I'm not sure about this love letter business, And in which case we've just said, that's fine, you don't have to do the love letter. Um, so let me show you some examples. This is an observational mapping, uh, behavioral mapping session. Um, based on our uh, the lounge of our main library. So each of those lines is a person and the, the numbers of the time that they came in and you're mapping their route through the space. And you often learn a lot about where people go, where they don't, also where they look and where they don't. Um, and so lots of libraries have done observational mapping and then done things like they've moved the digital screens uh, to above the staircase that everybody goes through because then you guarantee that they are actually in the eye line of the user and then they've seen effects on how penetrative the information that on the digital screens has been as a result so we noticed that um, the space to the Burton Library uh, we have these three buildings and one of them is the Burton Library people just weren't going in there and in fact some of the observations we noticed people kind of walking up to the door peering through it and then turning around and coming back uh, and also on the Touchstone tours, they weren't taking us to the Burton Library either. So when we got to the interviews, we were able to ask them about this. And sometimes on the maps, they didn't draw it. And it turned out nobody really knew what it was or what it was for. So instantly we had information we could use. So we were able to build up awareness of, of what the Burton was, what it did. We were able to tell relevant demographics about it more and improve our comms. And then we did some other things as well, which I'll, I'll talk about in a sec. Here is an example of a cognitive map. So this is a geographical map, not a process map. It's a map of the library and it's in three colours because we ask them to change colour of pen every uh, couple of minutes so that we can see the order in which they did things. And so in this case they have drawn the Burton but sometimes they didn't. Uh, it's really interesting hearing what they can remember, what they see of as, as important. And then you ask them to say, right, so tell me about this map. What are the kind of key locations for you? Where are your points of frustration? All that kind of stuff. And that leads to a really interesting conversation. You can also um, code the maps. So this is Emma, the, the intern's coding of the 25 maps. So the morale ground floor occurred on, on 20 of them, for example. So that's 83% uh, of the time. Um, and uh, you can see different areas there coming up and you can see what's important to people. What are the things that everybody knows about and puts down on their map? What are the more obscure things which there doesn't seem to be a deeper understanding of? So coding the maps is a really interesting thing to do. Here is um, some love and breakup letters. Um, this is interesting because it's a, ostensibly a love letter about the computer room. But halfway through it says, I guess because the light condition is a little worse here, we needed to walk to the switch every 20 or 10 minutes. Now that kind of thing is really annoying as a user. If you're if you're having to get up and wave your arms to get the light sensors working every 10 minutes, um, that's that's taking away from your user experience. And that's the kind of thing that would never come up in a survey. It would just never come up. So that insight is useful because then you can change it so that the sensor doesn't need triggering quite so often. Um, 
couple of interesting ones here. We have different um, study zones in the library, and it turns out the student really liked it in this case. I love the variety of atmospheres. Um, another person saying, crowded, 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 you know, really getting to the emotion of how much they find that a problem, the, the crowdedness. I love this one. I Thank you for the cafe. I enjoy the hot chocolate, although it tastes different every day. Again, never going to get that kind of insight from a survey. I, am, I must admit, that's not something we were able to design any changes to improve. Um, but it was still interesting to know. So just to take you back to this, this help, this first project then, it really was about trying all five of these techniques out. Um, and what we found is they were hugely useful. We learnt more about those 25 students than we'd known about all the students we'd ever looked at or talked to before. So we move quickly on to a second one, PGRUX, just looking at postgraduates in this case, targeted departments who were, whose postgraduates didn't seem as happy, generally not just with the library, but overall in the satisfaction kind of surveys. A smaller pool of, of people, and in this case, we just used a couple of techniques. We didn't do the touchstone tours or the mapping this time. We used maps going into unstructured interviews and love and breakup letters with some people and not with, with everybody. In this case, the cognitive map wasn't geographical. It was process based. So um, this is a map of my life as a postgraduate researcher. And they're drawing their, their map of their life. Sometimes they don't draw the library at all. Sometimes they do and you see where it fits in with other things. One of the best things about UX is it kind of zooms you out and takes, uh, gives you a holistic overview, this kind of top-down view of, of, of what the, the student experience is. So when, you're, when we're doing unstructured interviews, we ask open questions. We're not going to say, what's your favorite e-resource or, you know, what do you use most? What do you think of JSTOR? We're going to say, what does it look like when you're set an assignment? And that's it. That's as far as the question goes. And then we let them talk. And then we see whether e-resources even feature in that at all. And that, that wider perspective is, turns out to be, time and time again, absolutely invaluable. So between these two projects, we made some service tweaks. Um, and as I said, not groundbreaking, earth-shattering things, but significant for the users. We had a lot of Asian students who wanted a hot water drinking tap, and that came out strongly in the research, so we put that in, that went down really well. Um, we put in some whiteboards to try and give a sense of community space. So the postgraduate researchers, they didn't want to collaborate with people, um, but they did want to communicate and be part of a community. They wanted to sit next to another postgrad researcher. And although one of them might be doing physics and the other one might be doing English language, they don't want to talk about the research. They want to talk about being researchers. So we thought if we put some whiteboards in, people could start doing some just writing on the board, that that would spark conversations and, and deepen the sense of, of community. We also, um, you remember the Burton Library that no one took us to on the tours, no one drew on their maps. We asked people why they didn't find it useful and they said sometimes they said they didn't know what it was sometimes they said it closes at 10 p.m and the rest of the library is open 24 hours um, and even if we've got no intention of working till midnight we don't want to have to move our stuff at 10 p.m even you know it's just we don't want to do it so we don't work there um, and so we were wondering about making the, the Burton 24 hours anyway and this was enough of a push to get it done and what UX is really good at in my experience is pushing you over the line with changes you feel like you should make but haven't quite got around to making. It gives you the, the evidence. So it's not just a hunch. It's not just library staff saying, I think we should do X. It's user feedback saying, let's do it. So we made the Burton 24 hours. And sure enough, it's now much fuller during the day. Like even in the morning, it's got more people in because of that kind of almost psychological comfort of knowing you don't have to move. Uh, another thing we did was we changed various aspects of our catalogue. Um, and including having the class marks appearing in the search results. I can't believe we didn't have this before. Like you used to have to click on um, the, the class mark in order to get to where the book was. Sorry, click on find in library to find the class mark. Now we have it displayed on the search results screen so you can find it straight away. Another thing that came up was users saying they were too cold. Now, every single library in the world is either too cold or too hot for its users at any one time. We're all familiar with that. Um, but there's a difference between a survey with people saying it's too cold or people mentioning it in a tweet to having someone in front of you saying it's so cold in this building sometimes I have trouble working that's instantly you feel like I have to do something here. even if I can't fix the problem can I provide something that helps towards a solution and so 
we provided blankets. We just have blankets that anyone can help themselves to. Uh, kind of on the way into the library, there's a, a load of them in a bucket. And we put them in, people use them. They're actually much less attractive than the ones on the screen. We got deliberately drab grey blankets so people would be less likely to want to steal them. Um, and no one has so far, which is great. And we've laundered them regularly. And they've just gone down so well. Like of all the things I've ever done professionally, I can't think of something where there was so much happiness for so little investment of time. Um, they said, oh, it's awesomely wonderful. I love the idea of the blankets. Um, this is adorable and practical. Thank you so much for the blankets. The blankets available is the best thing in my life right now. Thank you. Um, so truly, people really appreciated the blankets. Um, so, you know, the whole thing of let's treat the the cause of the problem rather than the symptoms is brilliant in theory. But if you can't treat the cause of the problem, so in our case, we don't control the temperature of the library. Even if we did, we'd never get it right for everyone. Trying to treat the symptoms, you it, people love it when you treat this. They'd love it because you've helped. You've made the user experience better. Another technique that we tried out during this time, which customer services um, wanted to do and, and kind of led on, was a graffiti wall. And, and this is just, this has overtaken all the other forms of getting feedback that we ever had. Um, people love the fact that we write back. There's nothing more satisfying than that feedback loop being closed immediately by a member of staff acknowledging the comment. Um, so we've had loads of feedback via this. We reply, we try and incorporate the changes in what we do. Sometimes we are asked questions that are simply unfathomably difficult to answer um, but most of the time we can put some answers in and help people out uh, and that's been really popular so we're now on to 2016 and we had a massive change where we did the understanding academics project um, so this was the academic liaison team doing the field work we decided not to have an intern for this because we wanted the opportunity for 10 people in the team to learn how to use these techniques and also just to be in the room when people talked uh, 100 academics involved we interviewed 100 academics we spent a lot of time preparing for this uh, it spent a huge amount of time processing the data several months writing up the changes um, but it was completely worth it and we genuinely feel like we have more of an, an insight into academics than than anybody else you know it's been so valuable the aims really were to try and get a better understanding of how they approach their research and their teaching um, to look at where we fitted into that but also to, to truly understand the academic voice you know when we're designing services to actually be able to say with authority what an academic could and couldn't deal with what would actually fit into their life cycle um, what what is reasonable to ask of them and what isn't um, so we use cognitive maps into semi-structured interviews so it wasn't completely unstructured we had some questions that we knew we wanted to ask but we saved them for the end and just tried to base the conversation around whatever the academic wanted to talk about so Half of the interviews were research themed, half were teaching themed. So here's a teaching themed cognitive map. It was a map of take us through your process of designing a new module. And again, absolutely fascinating to see even if the library was listed in the map at all or not. Um, and just brilliant conversations. We learned so much uh, about what people wanted and needed and did. Uh, and we were able to make a lot of changes. Um, and uh, there are still more being made now, but some of them are. We changed the way that our flexible loan service works. So essentially, we, we put the academics onto the part-time package so they had longer to return books. We changed the way we communicated key information. So we've learnt to table papers at the big Board of Studies meeting, which is where basically all of the academics get together in one room uh, as by in each department. If we just talked about an item, then it got some traction. But we learned that every single important communication happens with a paper. So we just wrote papers about it and then everyone opens their laptops, checks during the meeting. You get a lot more traction for the ideas. Um, we had a huge amount of feedback on the reading list system. So when we changed to a new one, that was absolutely invaluable in making the choice and the changes that we've made to it. We changed the way that we review our database subscriptions. But yeah, there's other stuff as well. But more than that, what we ended up with is, is this rich seam of analyzed data. So these are the categories of data that we got um, and essentially this is all you know in used we used in vivo to analyze this This is all available at any time so I'm at the moment leading a project on our catalog I'm able to find all of the references that the hundred academics made to our catalog by going into the relevant part of the data so it's not just 
recommendations at the time, it's recommendations on an ongoing basis. Understanding Academics project was huge for us because it represented a change from this is interesting to this is invaluable, like this is essential. We got such a rich understanding. The academics themselves found it really interesting, so we produced reports for them as well about their own, essentially reflecting their own challenges back at them and uh, just about their life generally in, in academia, not just about the library. And we were able to, on an ongoing basis, truly understand them a lot better than we did before and, and design things better as a result. So, Last year's project was called UX Space, um, ran for the whole of 2017. It was focused on the Morel Lounge, um, the kind of area that you go into when you enter the library. Um, about three and a half thousand people coming out of that space a day, up to 7,000 at peak times, really key space in the university. And there was some kind of issues with it that we wanted to fix. And it involved a much wider pool of staff. So loads of customer services staff were, were involved. And we used behavioral mapping, but we modified it because we just couldn't track people's movements. There was too much movement in the space to, to realistically hope to track the way people move. So this is an example of one of our maps. Um, and you can see we actually had a printout of the space to help people with it so they weren't having to draw the landscape. Um, and then there's space for notes and the notes were absolutely key. All the observations from the customer services staff were essential in informing what we did next. So we had more than 40 sessions of behavioural mapping. We ended up with 17 pages of observations. We tried rapid prototyping. So basically we took furniture from other parts of the library and put it into this space to see if that would, if we could improve things without kind of buying anything essentially. And then we worked with the supplier to try and solve some acoustic problems. So essentially people at the help desk couldn't hear library staff and vice versa because there was so much noise spilling from that space. Everyone liked to group together in the Morel Lounge, catch up socially, sprawl around on the floor. And we wanted something that kind of looked smart but also absorbed some of that sound. So we bid for some money and we were fortunate to get a, a grant from our alumni office at the University of York. Uh, and we built uh, this. So this is a fabric wall. It's a wall made of fabrics, um, which is very uh, sound absorbent. It's extraordinary the change that it makes to the to the sound ar around you. Um, and I will just play you briefly uh, part of a video that we made to thank the um, the kind of alumni donors, so that you can see the wall in a bit more context. Just going to skip through. Okay, so here you can see where it sits. It helps everyone hear each other at the help desk and it also makes a really strong visual impression as you walk into the library. We built it. Okay, sorry, I've skipped a bit there. So um, just briefly, here is the wall being assembled. It essentially works like Lego bricks, like giant Lego bricks. Um, and it can be moved around. So far we haven't felt the need to move it. Um, but it's kind of, it's been a really positive thing. It's made a really strong impact. Lots of people have actually mentioned that it's made a huge difference to the sound. Um, so it's been our first significant investment in, in UX in terms of money spent and it's worked really, really well. Just going back to this timeline of, of UX, um, what I wanted to mention was that we're actually doing um, small amounts of UX in other projects as we go. So we contributed to the university's inclusive learning policy by using UX techniques involving disabled students. Um, we uh, worked with a specific department to try and improve their feedback by using UX techniques with them. The current catalogue improvement project that I'm leading on has a huge portion of, of UX around it. So um, it's been a smaller part of several other projects as well as these bigger projects that you see along the screen there. So that's basically what we've done. I hope that gives you kind of an understanding of how we've used it and maybe gives you some thoughts about how you might want to use it in your own institution. Um, I just want to take the last five minutes or so to just talk around what's happened apart from the projects themselves. So the first thing is is findings and dissemination. So we've taken a strategic approach to disseminating our work. We haven't just uh, left it to chance, we've tried to hit different audiences. So the internal audiences, every single person who's involved in one of our projects gets the report first and we've been um, sending an interim reports out and then final reports. So the internal audience at the university is a big part of what we do. The library industry 
Uh, we write on our Lib Innovation blog and we write regularly about all of our UX um, work on that, which is obviously open for anyone to find. The specific UX community in libraries, we've spoken at the, the UX Libs conference. Um, we've spoken to specialists, uh, for example, the research clusters in computer sciences that deal with UX at York. We've spoken to them. We've gone outside of HE to, uh, for example, spoken at a uh, a digital inclusion charity called the Good Things Foundation. And we've also just put our stuff on SlideShare so that anyone can find it. And as it happens, SlideShare, which is kind of in its death throes, it seems to me, but it, they put our presentation on their homepage and just left it there for quite a long time. And as a result, um, we've got 873,000 views for, for one of our presentations. And that's had a huge impact. Lots of other libraries have got in touch with us about this and, and talked to us since then. So. Uh, we're trying to tell people about it as much as we can, basically. Share everything that we're doing. In terms of steering and, and strategy, like how we move UX forward in the organisation, um, Understanding Academics Project was so successful, so Michelle Blake, our Head of Relationship Management, went to the senior management team and said, right, building off the back of this, we want to do certain things. We want to make it part of the culture. We want to have at least one major UX project every year, even while we're using techniques in smaller projects. Uh, we want to form a UX group, so we now have a group made up of different staff from across the library who just provide guidance and, and steering for the UX at the institution. We're not doing it all ourselves, but for example, if someone's going to do a project, they'll come and ask us about it. We'll give them advice if we can, and we're, we're representing all the different parts of the library on our group. And we also have a UX book club where people can, basically every meeting we read an article together in advance and discuss it in the meeting as a way of trying to stay on top of the literature. Um, we had this government standard thing uh, in the UK called the Customer Service Excellence and it's a kind of an award that you have to keep applying for and UX has been a huge part of our where they've been particularly impressed with what we've done um, in, in terms of the customer insight so the fact that it's contributing to this kind of big official award has helped us embed it in the culture of the organisation um, it's also fed directly into the library strategy, so we have these three strands to our, our library strategy and UX has been a huge part of informing those, particularly the Understanding Academics project was very big in, in actually just dictating what the three strands would be and of course fulfilling the remit of each of those strands, UX is a big part of that too. In terms of training and, and support, everybody who does UX at our institution has some training from one of us who's done it a lot. Um, so all of the customer services staff who were involved in that behavioural mapping, they all had one-on-one -on -one training before they before they did it. We've done generic sessions for all staff. We've also done kind of specialist sessions. We've also taken it to other parts of the university. So we've run training for other non-library bits of the, of the like the career service, for example, on, on how to use it. And that's been that's been really successful as well. Um, and this original toolkit that the, our intern Emma began to develop, we've continued to develop that. So that has, you know, examples of consent forms in, it has um, project details, it has people's experiences of using the techniques, advice and guidance on how to do it, all of that kind of thing. It's got a glossary of UX terms. So uh, it's got a list of all the projects we've ever done and the outputs. So that's been uh, a kind of a key thing that we're continuing to develop and it enables anyone with an interest in UX to get a good understanding of it before they start using it. So very finally, uh, a path to embedding UX. So if you think UX is for you, and I really would recommend investing time in it, it's really great. Um, here are some tips for trying to make it part of the culture of the organisation. Um, the first thing is you do need buy-in from the big boss. Um, you can only get so much done. What has happened in the UK a lot is people are very happy for the ethnography to take place, but when it comes to design changes, there's been a lot more caution. So if you've got true buy-in from the management in your library, you're much more likely to be able to make design changes happen. Make small changes, see what the reaction is, and, and try to be brave, basically. Um, UX is not cool. Like as soon as we stop thinking of it as this kind of cool new thing, the better. It's not a fad. It's not bright and shiny. It's just useful. Like it's it's just useful. So I think it's really important to get out of the mindset of it being this kind of cool thing and just be something that we treat of uh, as a day-to-day -day useful thing. 
We found that going beyond the walls of our institution has been really useful. The more credibility we've had from outside York, the more credibility our work has had inside York. So if you're doing UX, get out and talk about it at conferences like this one um, and, and, and then, you know, build a reputation for it. So we have a new director at York. Uh, who's just come in and he already knew about the UX work that we've done because we talk about it a lot and he's really committed to continuing it and that's a great thing. Um, time is very important for UX. It has to be made. Like you cannot fit UX into existing workflows without making some provision for it because it takes time. It takes time to invest in the staff to get everyone up to speed. It takes time to train people. It takes time to keep up to date with what's going on. Obviously, the projects themselves take time. Actually having enough time to analyze the results, to truly learn from them is, is really lengthy. And acting on the data takes time as well. And finally, we found that you get more impact from quality than quantity. Like it's not a case of thinking, you need to be doing UX all the time. Let's just set up like five different projects and get them all going at once. It's about using it at the right time when there is enough time to do so and when the insight that you get will justify the amount of investment that it requires. So if you can do something truly interesting and make a, a genuine change as a result, that's what allows UX to kind of put down roots and become embedded in the culture because people notice the change. They notice the improved feedback from the user because they've had a different and improved user experience and that's what allows the momentum to develop so that you get more and more done okay i've gone a minute over my time apologies for that um if you would like to learn more about our ux stuff then lib innovation is the is the uh blog that we tend to write about uh, on a lot and we embed presentations there as well um so uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope that's useful. I feel slightly weird because I'm aware that I'm now going to talk to you live via Skype, but I'm saying goodbye here because I'm doing this on Monday and we're speaking to each other on Friday. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope it was okay in the video format. I know it's slightly strange to sit there watching video rather than having the face-to-face -face connection, but it's been really interesting to prepare this. Thank you very much for having me and um, I'll speak to you face-to-face -face in a second. Cheers.